Hello again, friends and fellow people who like learning about stuff. Welcome to episode 14, kind of episode 14, depending on what we call an episode, as Ethan said, 14-ish, 16-ish of the Urban Ecology Center's Extraordinary Wildlife in Your Backyard, Oak Signals. And today we're tackling a very large, very important element of your backyard or a nearby green space. Quite often, the largest organism anywhere you go are trees, whether as an individual or a colony. Uh, they certainly are in the conversation of the largest organisms on the planet, along with things like colonies of, of fungi. But first, we're gonna take a bit of a side trip to talk about moths. The New York Times, just on Wednesday of this week, two short days, two short days ago, came out with this great article called The Pleasures of Moth Watching. The first line reads, it's high moth season and drawing you out in the dark is one of the many ways moths can enrich your life if you let them. Like many of us, the author was formerly into bird watching and butterfly watching, but she points out that while there are about 700 species of birds in North America and about 750 species of butterflies, there are roughly 11,000 species of moths. Birds and butterflies hold similar appeal in that they're mainly out in the daytime and they're usually nice and colorful. The author mentions that she still follows these daytime animals in her backyard, but has recently enjoyed starting to pay attention to what she calls the night shift in her backyard. So the fireflies, the scarab beetles, the caddisflies, giant millipedes, bristletails, all potential future episodes here because they're all in our backyard at night. And so uh, I definitely will do a moth talk and if you have a favorite backyard moth let me know but if you're currently a bird watcher or a butterfly watcher now might be a great time to try out a new hobby uh, of moth watching and the timing of this new york times article couldn't be better because as ethan mentioned uh, the urban ecology center has tools to help you start moth watching and next week thursday is our second yardversity event nocturnal yardversity in the first yardversity event some of you and many other backyard naturalists across the country went out and documented the species in their backyards. Uh, we had over 20 participants document about 300 species in their backyards in just over an hour, uh, including Joe's daughter out in Massachusetts. Next Thursday, we're gonna be collectively entering our backyards at night to see how many nocturnal species we can add to this collective list. So I really hope you can join this effort. All you really need is a flashlight, preferably a headlamp, and we'll see, we'll show you in a minute how you can kind of supplement this, this party, but I promise you, you'll be pleasantly surprised by what you'll see in your backyard uh, at night, no matter where you live. We'll also have a special guest with us next Thursday evening from the UEC in My Backyard. Community program educator Erin Whitney will join the program. And let's enjoy her short, clever video on how to throw a moth party. Hi, my name's Erin, and I'm an educator at Urban Ecology Center. And today, we're throwing a moth party. To get started, you might want a camera or a notebook for your observations, a white or a light colored sheet, an old jar and a banana or a banana peel, an extension cord and a light bulb, or some way to illuminate your sheet for the moths to flutter to. And popcorn, don't forget the popcorn. While you can try any light bulb you have at home, moths are really attracted to lights with shorter wavelengths, like UV or more violet portions of the spectrum. To set up for your moth party, find a spot to hang your sheet, somewhere where you can later have the light bulb shining on it or behind it safely. And remember, light bulbs can get really hot, so if you need to walk away, just put a pause on the party and turn the light bulb off until you come back. So not all moths are attracted to light, so if you'd like to lure them with a smelly delight, it's called moth sugaring. You're going to want to take one banana or banana peel a few days before and let it sit in a jar with a little sugar and some sunlight so it starts to ferment. 
We're gonna blend up our banana or banana peel now until we get about an applesauce consistency in our blender. With a spoon or a paintbrush, you can start to apply your sugaring jar contents to nearby trees or spots in your backyard. Try to keep them at eye level so that if a moth lands, you'll be sure to see it. There's 11,000 species of moths in North America, and through citizen science projects like iNaturalist and National Moth Week, over 140 species have already been spotted in Milwaukee. Be sure to document your observations and share who flew on through with us at UEC in my backyard. What does a moth learn in school? Mathematics? Every video should end with, I think every video should end with a joke. Um, all right. So you have one week to get prepared for next week. And as Aaron mentioned, a black light is best, but any light will have some effect. And then, and then you can lure moths in with several different treats like that fermented banana peel milkshake. Um, and then, of course, Ethan is a great resource for getting started on iNaturalist. So again, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. next Thursday, we'll be on YouTube Live. Uh, while some of you hopefully will be collecting valuable data from your backyards on moths and other critters, this is something brand new. I think we're all going to learn a ton. Uh, you, you can also just visit your backyard flowers and other plants with a headlamp to see what's around. It's not just moths. So look under logs other, and other objects on the ground. Um, you can look especially for eye shine. Uh, which is a reflection of the light from your headlamp off of the tapetum at the back of the eye of many critters. It's especially useful for finding things like moths and spiders. In fact, it's really fun to just put on a headlamp and look at your, even the grass in your backyard, and oftentimes you'll just see these little tiny shining pearls, and if you go up to them, most of them are spiders in your grass. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really fun way to explore your, your backyard at night. Um, and, and we'll also end with some nocturnal trivia with Danny Pirtle. So hope to see you next Thursday evening, and you can register now on the UEC website. But today we're talking about trees, uh, and this is the first time we've explored the plant kingdom in this series. We've already covered four species of birds, four species of mammals, so I'm likely to hit a few plants in the coming months, and because there's so many fascinating things to talk about when it comes to trees and plants, I'm not gonna get into things like what makes a plant a plant today, uh, or things like reproduction and growth. We'll cover those in future episodes. Um, plus when you get past kingdom, it gets a little muddy with respect to trees because there's no order of trees, like there's an order of woodpeckers. Trees don't really fall in any specific phylogenetic groupings. They're, they're cross groupings because they're more of a growth form, like a vine or a shrub. So that leads us to our first big question. What makes something a tree? Um, according to Colin Tudge in his book with a fabulous title, The Tree, he defines a tree as a big plant with a stick up the middle, which then leads to the question, what does big mean? A forester, for example, might define this aspect of a tree as a woody plant reaching a minimum height of five or six meters. If an acorn falls in fertile soil, it will likely grow into a huge stately tree. But if that same acorn is less fortunate and is dropped by a blue jay into a fissure in a rock, it may never grow more than a few feet tall. So do we call one of these a tree and the other not a tree if they come from the same acorn? Uh, so height, it, it may be convenient from a forestry perspective to give a tree a minimum height below which it would be called a shrub, but the reality is much more blurry. And later we'll be looking at the chinkapin oak, which again can grow into a huge stately tree in the right conditions. And this tree is very closely related to the dwarf chinkapin oak, which is more shrub-like. So even though they're closely related, is one a tree and one a shrub, uh, maybe. 
And what about the big stick up the middle of the plant, defining it as a tree, a, a one main trunk? Uh, again, you can take that same seed and put it in different growing conditions, and you might see two vastly different shapes. A western red cedar, under some conditions, can grow into what we would say looks like a tree because it has the one trunk, the one stick up the middle. But sometimes the same tree in conditions will, will cause them to have, in different conditions, will cause them to have several trunks, which we would normally categorize as a shrub, but you wouldn't call this a shrub because it's too big. So does a tree really need to have one central trunk? Again, it's more of a, a kind of a loose guideline. And then what about that central trunk? Does it have to be made of wood? Uh, these banana trunks aren't made of wood. They're, they're actually made of leaf stems that are strengthened by water pressure. You, you could probably push these over. Uh, but do we call it a tree? Uh, I don't know. In, in a way, a tree isn't a type of plant more than a way of being a plant. And the definition of a tree is more of a convenience for humans. So then Tudge later refines his definition. He changes definition from a big plant with a stick up the middle to a big plant with a stick up the middle, or could be if it grew in the right circumstances, or is very closely related to other plants that are big and have a stick up the middle, or resembles a big plant with a stick up in the middle. So a much more concise definition to work with. Um, the answer to the question, what is a tree? It's really, again, more of a, a guideline than a definition. Basically, a tree has four major parts, what we might consider the equivalent of organs. They have the roots, the stem and the branches, the flowering and fruiting parts, and the leaves. Roots are concentrated almost entirely in the top two to three feet of soil, even for the biggest trees. So often you see images of trees where the roots kind of mirror the above ground portion, but roots don't go that deep. So a more accurate interpretation of the form of a tree is more like a wine glass with, with the roots kind of spreading vertically at the base. And, and we'll talk more about tree anatomy in, in future episodes, but quick bit of trivia, the, the xylem is Greek for wood and also is what the xylophone is named after because uh, the keys are made of wood. And xylophone also is famous for being the only example of a word starting with X when you're singing alphabet songs. Since most of these episodes do have a specific organism at their core, uh, I'll, I'll continue our tree journey with one of my favorite trees, the chinkapin oak. Um, I'm not quite sure that any tree can top the sugar maple for me though, because of my love of maple syrup and all things maple and definitely will be a, a future lecture, but mainly because it's a great way to illustrate the physiology of nutrient flow and, and uh, tapping the sap, the xylem, the phloem, et cetera. But um, the chink chinkapin oak is, is for sure a top 10, along with hemlock, tamarack, the butternut hickory, quaking aspen, balsam fir. I've got a lot of favorite trees. And it was fun during our discussion before that, you know, we explored two questions. So do you have, do you have a favorite tree species and do you have a favorite tree? According to tree expert J. Casey Clapp on the Ologies podcast with Ali, Ali Ward, 80% of the time people answer, what is your favorite tree with the willow tree? And none of you answered the willow tree. So uh, I'm thinking this is more of a, a hunch from him rather than scientific data. But that second question, do you have an individual favorite tree, isn't normally a question you would ask with wildlife. I mean, you probably have favorite dogs or cats that have been in your life, and, and you may have a favorite wildlife sighting uh, or you know, a memory of seeing something like a coyote, but I don't think there are many other species of wildlife where we could talk about our favorite individual. I don't know, do you... you do you have a favorite individual squirrel or a favorite individual mushroom? You might, uh, but I'll, I'll be willing to bet you don't have as deep a relationship with those other organisms as you probably have had with individual trees. As we talked about earlier, uh, a tree you climbed as a child or one you planted or someone you love planted and you watched it grow. I, I, have a quite, I have quite a bit of nostalgia and enjoy talking about the willow tree at my parents' house that if I climbed all the way to the top, I could see the pharmacy a couple blocks away. Um, and I'm also attached to this spruce tree that I planted in my parents' yard. The 
cherry tree that I used to climb is no longer there physically, but lives on in my memory, mainly because of the delicious cherry cobblers my mom made from its fruit. And as an adult, I was out on a, a good friend's property walking with some other good friends when we came across a lone, small chinkapin oak that was out on an overlook near West Bend. Robin knows this oak. Um, and I just became fascinated with that tree. And later when my son Henry was born, I wanted to plant a tree in our backyard to commemorate the event, and I decided on a, on a chinkapin oak. So that's why for today's talk, at least, I'm, I'm focusing on this particular tree. Um, if, you're, if you're keeping track, I did also plant a tree when my daughter Cece was born. Um, and because I don't want to contribute to any sibling rivalries, the bitternut hickory will be featured in a future episode. And we can, we can also look at individual trees that aren't necessarily important to us, but have important value in our history and often have been named, uh, a journey that Tudge takes us through in his book. Here's a picture of the royal oak in England. It is said that King Charles II hid in this tree from Cromwell's men after the Battle of Worcester in 1651. I imagine this was part of a bigger forest and maybe there were some big cracks or climbed the trees. I don't know how he hid in them. Uh, I did late, later learn that this, which is now called the Royal Oak, is actually an offspring of the Royal Oak. Even though the Royal Oak could have lived till today, they easily live a thousand years. But apparently tourists took too many clippings from the actual Royal Oak uh, because of its history and then actually ended up killing it. Here's the major oak in Sherwood Forest. And it is said that Robin Hood and his merry men, if they existed, feasted beneath this tree 800 years ago. It's still alive today. It was voted Britain's favorite tree. Uh, and as you can see here, has been fitted with many a prosthetic support in its old age. The Fortingall yew tree in Scotland is estimated to be, this particular tree is estimated to be between 2,500 and 5,000 years old and has a label suggesting that the young Pontius Pilate sat in its shade wondering what the future held. The cowrie tree is native to New Zealand, and the biggest and oldest cowrie trees are given personal names. So this one is Tain Mahuta, and it's approximately 1,700 years old. And for the first 900 or so years of this tree's life, it witnessed moas, which were flightless birds that, are, that were twice as big as ostriches at about 12 feet high uh, before they were hunted to extinction by the Maoris that arrived from Polynesia. And the tree also witnessed the host's eagles that preyed upon the moas that also later went extinct. Um, the the host's eagles were twice as big as the largest eagles in the world today, the harpy eagle. And it's about the only thing that could have uh, preyed upon the moas. Many redwoods alive and standing in California today were already old when Columbus made Europe aware that the Americas existed. And one of these redwoods named Hyperion is the tallest tree in the world at 380 feet, which is the same height as the Kilburn Tower in Milwaukee. Some of California's bristlecone pines germinated a thousand years before human beings invented writing and are still alive today, like this 4,800-year-old specimen. And there's a, a somewhat tragic and unfortunate story that happened recently with what was believed to have been the oldest tree on Earth. A young researcher, you can, you can look this up, a young researcher was performing a study of these extremely old trees, taking core samples, which is one way to find the age of a tree. They take a very small core out of the tree, about as thin as a pencil, to, to, to find out the age, uh, and he was having particular trouble with one of the trees. Uh, it had already gobbled up a couple of his tools, and so he, he asked permission from the Forest Service to cut down the tree, and they gave him permission, and the tree that he cut down ended up being the oldest tree in the world. So 
he endured quite a bit of pain personally and in his career for, for this unfortunate decision. Um, here's a tree near Calcutta considered to be the broadest tree in the world. This is one single tree with many prop buttresses that covers the size of a football field. And trees, in addition to their physical prowess, also have a lot of stories, a lot of very bizarre stories in their relationships with other creatures. So, you know, we, we probably think of our trees as having relationships with squirrels and birds. Um, if you go around the world, you find relationships like the coconut palm and the giant hermit crabs in the Pacific Islands. These are real pictures. Uh, the, the garbage can picture kind of helps you grasp the immense size of these tree climbing crabs. They, they actually climb the coconut trees, grab the coconuts, and eat them uh, without the aid of a machete. So very, very bizarre and strange creature that I would love to meet someday. All right. When areas of the Amazon rainforest flood, they, they submerge an area the size of England. You, if you've been to the Milwaukee County Zoo, you've seen the exhibit of the flooded forest. Uh, and so you get trees having relationships with things like river dolphins and fish. Uh, fish help disperse the fruits. And, and so you get animals swimming way up in the forest canopy areas, you know, can, forest canopy, um, in places that are normally 100 or more feet off the ground. You get dolphins and fish. Uh, if if mon monkeys, instead of jumping from tree to tree, are doing a little more swimming if they can. And uh, there's other stories like little blue penguins nesting in the forest of New Zealand uh, with parrots. There's, there's one tree in, in Panama, an, an individual tree that had more than 1,100 different species of beetles. And one tree in Costa Rica, scientists found more than 4,000 species of organisms on a single kapok tree. So uh, we talked about this a little bit in the mycorrhizae episode. We, we don't think trees are aware, but they can simulate awareness in their relationships with other organisms. They share resources, they communicate danger, they attract beneficial insects, sometimes even attracting insects to their own peril to be consumed eventually by the tree through their relationship with fungi and bacteria. And my wife just told me the story of a forest fire in northern Wisconsin that was started because some camp counselors lit a fire on an island in a flowage, so completely surrounded by water. They're on an island. They light a fire, put the fire out, and leave. Uh, but the fire ended up traveling underground, under the water, through the root and mycorrhizal system, and then reignited hundreds of feet away to start a fire. So even though the, the party kind of did what you're supposed to, they put out the fire, they didn't realize that underneath the ground, the embers were still glowing and spreading. Uh, so it's something to think about when you're when you're camping. Uh, you know, use a use a designated fire pit, or or be really sure you know what you're doing. And because I love etymology, the study of trees is called dendrology. The root of the word is Greek for tree, and in our bodies, in our nervous systems, in our nerves, the parts of our nerves that branch like trees are called dendrites. And I also got a better idea of the differences behind the names of the different people who study trees. So if you're an arborist, that means you're primarily managing urban trees. You're planting them, you're removing them, you're pruning them. Uh, and there's no doubt that trees bring tremendous value to neighborhoods from an economic standpoint to a public health standpoint to an ecological standpoint. So that's an arborist. If you're a dendrologist, that means you're a tree researcher and you're usually studying a specific kind of tree or a, a group of trees or a specific aspect of physiology or classification. And if you're a forester, you're usually dealing with the economic side of trees in, in board feet of lumber or pulp or paper or other things. And, and while that may bring kind of a negative connotation, sustainable forestry is, is going to be a huge part of creating a sustainable world. So an arborist on the left, dendrologist in the middle, and a forester on the right. The effect that trees have had on humans and particularly the evolution of humans is enormous and just can't be understated. 
Uh, in fact, there's strong evidence linking our success and particularly our intelligence to our time in the trees. So th there's a lot of animals out there that we rank high in intelligence, like chimpanzees, dolphins, and, and even pigs. But it's thought that because our ancestors lived in trees for so long, that resulted in us evolving highly dexterous hands uh, and, and opposable thumbs, which are extremely important for getting around in the trees. But then humans left the trees and, and started exploring the savannas and we became bipedal walking on two legs. But we still had these dexterous hands that weren't being put to use in climbing, um, at least not the extent that we, we were used to. So then our hands became tools for our brains to play with, uh, to build things, to engineer things, to kind of shape our thoughts and ideas into actions and, and to create the ideas in space. So that resulted in thousands of different kinds of tools and then engineering breakthroughs. So hands that were shaped by 80 million years of living in trees were now free for us to use as an extension of our brain. Uh, some historians argue that Every age in our history, like the Bronze Age or the Iron Age, was also the Wood Age. Uh, wood throughout our history was used for fuel, which allowed for the smelting of the bronze and the iron. We, we of course, have used wood in construction of buildings and boats, which allowed empires to expand. Um, trees supplied important drugs, oils, glues, hunting poisons, uh, paper for writing, pots, drums for music, tools for art. Uh, and so trees have, and trees have had and, and continue to have a, a great spiritual value to many cultures, um, if, if, if even just providing the shade to relax in your backyard. So, so trees and wood, uh, again, it just can't be understated the importance that they've had on humankind. Um, we'll talk on more about trees in later, later episodes, but back to our chinkapin oak. Uh, let's start with the oak trees. At a basic level, they're flowering plants or angiosperms. They're in the order of Fagales, where it's gr they're grouped with uh, birches and walnuts. And the family Fagaceae consists of beeches, chestnuts, and oaks. So those are all the trees that oaks are related to. But if something is called an oak, a true oak, that means it's a tree or shrub in the genus Quercus. And there are about 600 species of oaks in the world today. Um, there are some trees in other genera with oak in the name, like stone oak, silky oaks, she oaks, and uh, which are the cassowarian trees of the old world. But true oaks are found in the genus Quercus. Oak leaves are primarily lobate, meaning they're indented and the indentations don't reach the center of the leaf. Several oaks and beeches are marescent. That's your word of the day. Marescent means they hold on to their leaves through the winter and into the spring instead of dropping them in the fall like a lot of the other deciduous trees. Oak trees are monoecious, meaning that a single tree produces both male flowers in the form of catkins and female flowers on the same plant, but there's just a lot of built-in mechanisms to keep them from self-fertilizing. Uh, and it's, it's the fruit that the female flower produces that uh, leads to one of the most iconic feature of oak trees, the acorn, also known as the oak nut. Uh, the acorn contains one or two seeds enclosed in, the, in that tough leathery shell, which kind of pops out of that protective structure, uh, which is called a cupule, that only partly encloses the nuts. In other species, the cupule fully encloses the nut. Uh, in fact, the word acorn has a Gothic root, meaning fruit of the unenclosed land, and originally was called an oak corn, which then later was combined to be ache corn. Uh, acorns are a useful tool for species identification. Uh, I was told by one of my naturalist mentors that the best way to identify a burr oak acorn is that it resembles the beetle's, whoops, the beetle's haircut from the early 60s. So uh, acorns, play a huge role in forest ecology in the form of mast or food available to wildlife as it accumulates on the forest floor, often seasonally. Uh, I mean, not even seasonally, often uh, in, in, in abundance one year, 
and then a couple of years of less abundance. So it's, it's uh, that kind of asynchronous uh, masting that is communicated or somehow known by all of the oak trees, uh, e even in different states, to mast in certain years. Um, there's even a bird named after the old oak nut, the acorn woodpecker, which you can see here is caching hundreds of acorns for the winter. And any bird or any animal that caches, eats acorns, has the potential to disperse it, which is good for the plant. And a lot of other wildlife species also depend on acorns, uh, including some that are familiar to our backyard. I think we all associate the squirrel with acorns, but also mice bears, and during the fall, 25% of the diet of the white-tailed deer is acorns, uh, which is why acorns are often used as bait by hunters. In parts of Europe, pigs are let loose in oak groves to fatten up on acorns that are massing, which, uh, which apparently affects the taste of their meat. And even some of those, uh, the moth larvae we talked about, uh, moths or beetles, will burrow into and then consume an acorn from the inside. And so you've probably come across acorns with this nice little round hole carved in the side, uh, which is evidence of a grub living and developing inside. Of course, anything that eats an acorn, including humans, must deal with the astringent and slightly toxic tannins that they contain. The tannins are to keep mushrooms and insects away, uh, but some animals like these beetle larvae evolved to metabolize the tannins well. Other species uh, that eat acorns will focus on plants that have acorns with fewer tannins. Some squirrels will wait until after a rain because the rainwater will leach some of the tannins away. And humans for a long time have processed acorns with cold water to make an acorn flower. As lumber, oak is considered a hard and strong wood and the tannins we just mentioned make it naturally resistant to insect and fungal attacks, so good for construction. Uh, it also has a very appealing pattern in the grain markings, and it's been used in ships at least going back to the Viking times, probably uh, well before that, and in, in many buildings through history. Oak barrels age wine, sherry, brandy, and whiskey. There's a species of oak called the cork oak, the bark of which is used to make their namesakes to stop the end of wine bottles uh, with a cross section seen here. And I hadn't heard of this one before, but the, the galls of some oak species, and galls can be caused by either a fungus or an insect, uh, are mixed with iron sulfate to produce something called iron gall ink, which was used primarily in Europe between the 5th and 14th centuries, but still is available uh, today. And then a few words about my favorite oak, the chinkapin oak. Oaks are divided into white oaks, red oaks, intermediate oaks, and ring-cupped oaks, and the chinkapin is grouped with the white oaks. Uh, it mostly takes the form of a tree, but can sometimes be a shrub. Uh, the chinkapin oak's Latin name is Quercus, Mullenbergii, in honor of Gott Gotthilf Heinrich Ernst Mullenberg, a Lutheran pastor and an amateur botanist from Pennsylvania. And the common name Chinkapin is a Powhatan word, which is an extinct Eastern Algonquian language spoken by the Powhatan. And, and it's actually named based on the plant's resemblance to another species, the Allegheny Chinkapin, uh, which is a relative of the American chestnut. So common names for the Chinkapin oak include the yellow chestnut oak, rock oak, and yellow oak. The range of the chinkapin oak can be seen here, and Milwaukee just falls into the northern tip of the natural range. It's listed by the Wisconsin DNR as a special concern plant, mainly found in oak savannas, edges of woods, and banks along water. Most of Milwaukee was forest until European settlement, but there were some open areas either naturally along waterways or managed by indigenous populations. Um, oak savannas, on the other hand, went from being one of the most common vegetation types in the Midwest to one of the rarest plant communities on earth. And in Wisconsin, it's estimated that only one one hundredth of a percent of the original oak savanna are left, uh, which is a huge conservation concern and one of the reasons that chinkapin oaks are, are threatened. 
Pioneers used it straight wood to make thousands of miles of fences and railroad ties, and the wood was used to fuel steamships running between Pittsburgh and New Orleans. One interesting characteristic of the chinkapin oak is it, it's said that its acorns are said are to be are one of the sweetest of any of the oaks. Uh, they're described as having an excellent taste even when eaten raw, which I have yet to experience, uh, and I'm reticent to experience. Um, if you wish to try that on your own, I would say don't, unless you're with someone that knows what they're doing. That doesn't include me. Um, and as you can see here, the leaves of the chinkapin are kind of oak-like, but they lack the lobes associated with the typical oaks. And the leaves actually look closer to the American beech on the bottom here, which again is a close relative, uh, but the two can be separated out fairly easily based on the leaf shape and other characteristics. So in addition to providing shade, comfort, uh, economic and wildlife value, trees provide great stories. And I'll end the talk with a story from the chinkapin oak that I planted in my backyard when Henry was born. I don't have a good picture of the whole tree because it's, it's kind of nestled in with our American plum and our serviceberry tree, but, but here's a picture of a specific part of the trunk uh, that's central to the story. So when my son was three, and this tree was already about six or seven feet tall. Uh, he was out playing in the backyard. He was really into the Jungle Book uh, at the time. And he particularly liked the, the parade of elephants in the Jungle Book that, that sang the march and as they kind of crashed through the forest. And uh, Henry was very much into imitating his favorite characters uh, at the time and he loved elephants. So he was out pretending to be one of those elephants from the Jungle Book and, and he proceeded to march and sing across the yard. And when he got to his tree, he just snapped it right in half. And uh, I, I gasped. I probably spit out my coffee. I immediately called my plant genius friend, Joel Springsteen, with desperation in my voice, explaining the situation, hoping there was something I could do to save his tree. Uh, and after calling, calming me down, Joel explained that if I were to make a clean diagonal cut, above the next node on the tree where he broke it that had a branch coming out. Uh, that node would then take over as the main trunk and continue to, to grow into the sky. So with a bit of skepticism, I carried out his instructions and then sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So this is, this is what it looks like today. You can hardly even notice that anything happened here, that it, the, the trunk had been snapped in half. Um, but it's just interesting when a tree is injured, uh, or if a limb comes off, the tree doesn't heal that tissue, it seals it up in kind of a, a containment strategy, contain the problem and move on. So they, they, they close off the area that's damaged and then they keep moving. And sometimes they'll even self prune if, if there's a branch that's in a bad spot in the forest, either because there's another tree there or related to sunlight, they will uh, kind of seal off that branch. The branch will die probably when a a crow comes and lands on it and uh, and then the tree will continue to grow. So I didn't know at the time, but Henry, Henry gave me a, a really good opportunity to learn how trees don't heal, they seal and keep on growing. <laughs>